Our next speaker is Indiana Senate Majority Leader Grant Hirschman. Leader Hirschman currently serves as Majority Floor Leader and Chairman of the Tax and Fiscal Policy Committee. This is his third term in office. He has been honored by the Indiana Chamber of Commerce as the Small Business Champion and was named Legislator of the Year by the Indiana Association of Cities and Towns. And interesting fact, in his spare time, he's also a private pilot. So, I'll turn it over to him. Well, I gotta give Lieutenant Governor a hard time before he sneaks out of here. I, I would just point out, I've gotta agree with him about North Dakota and South Dakota, <laughs> uh, but I would point out on Indiana's behalf that Peyton Manning was born in Cajun country, matriculated in Tennessee, and spent his best year in Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs> I am, uh, I'm going to paraphrase Mark Twain just a little bit. Uh, many, many years ago, he said, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read the newspaper, you're misinformed. I'd say, uh, i just include the electronic media in that. If you believe the electronic media, the Republican Party is dead. Uh, we might as well not be here this morning, finish our cup of coffee, we're pack it up, and go home. Uh, however, you might be misinformed if that's what you believe. And, and I think it says a great deal when we're in here arguing between Tennessee, North Dakota, and South Dakota about who's the freest state, who's got the best tax climate, and who's the most friendly for jobs because it stands in pretty stark contrast uh, to what's going on at the federal level. Across the nation, you've got 50 laboratories of innovation with a couple of notable exceptions that are working very hard to follow the basic core conservative principles that built this country. And one of the things I think we have to um, we have to guard against is cynicism in the general public. I always encourage voters to be skeptical, ask questions, because I think Republican values acquit very well when you ask tough questions and some of the, the liberal arguments kind of fall apart. But if you're cynical, you say they're all bums. It doesn't matter. Everything's the same doesn't matter who we elect president. But the states stand in stark contrast and show that it does matter. In fact, whenever I have any of my constituents say that, I tell them to just look west a few miles, and there's Illinois standing as a big sore thumb about everything to be wrong. In fact, we uh, apparently encouraged some of our Democrat legislators to spend some time in Illinois, along with the Wisconsin delegation uh, <laughs> last year, just to find out what the, how the other half lived. Uh, but I would say that it hasn't been easy. And part of our challenge is getting the word out about what we're doing. I had the opportunity to uh, spend some time at Harvard a couple of years ago. And uh, I was listening to the Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation discuss state budgeting as a comparative tax policy program. And the foundation said, well, we have cut our budget to the bone in Massachusetts. The only thing we have left to do is raise taxes. Now, this was the pro-business uh, advocate. And I'm looking at him, and, and I had brought my Indiana Fiscal Handbook uh, with me because that's how exciting I really am. And uh, I looked in the guide, and it said that Massachusetts and Indiana have almost exactly the same population. And Massachusetts spends almost exactly double what the state of Indiana spends in its budget. I spent some time wandering around Cambridge, and uh, although it's fine, I, legal seafood is great. Um, I didn't see a 100% improvement in the quality of living in Massachusetts as compared to Indiana based upon what we spend in the budget, so I raised my hand. And I said, well, I, I hate to disagree with you, but I think you could spend a little less money because we do it on about half what you do. And he said, where are you from? And I, he said, I said, Indiana. And he said, well, yeah, um, Massachusetts has had a lot tougher hit from the recession, I think, than Indiana has. And I looked at him and I said, well, our employment's up around 9% and we're a heavy manufacturing state and all, I think that's kind of hooey. And he said, he said well, yeah, and then again, you got Mitch Daniels as governor and, and they've done a great job there. And I looked at him and I said, well, he had help. And he has help because groups like GOPAC are helping elect state legislators to spread that message and fight with other states about who can be uh, the strongest adherent to conservative core values. And I will tell you, it's a story of success, and it's also a cautionary tale. Indiana is not uh, a rock-solid Republican state. Uh, quite often, people think that it is, because uh, oftentimes it's the first state to go for a Republican presidential candidate. 
But it is also the state of Birch Bayh and Evan Bayh and Joe Donnelly. When I first started in politics, we had a Democrat a congressional delegation, seven Democrats, three Republicans. It's a state with labor history. It's a state with a uh, populist character to some degree. And uh, yet, we now have a supermajority for the first time in the Indiana House, a supermajority in the Indiana Senate, 37 Republicans, 13 Democrats, and a Republican governor. And you ask yourself, how did that happen? Well, I can only speak for the Senate. We had 18 of the 25 seats up for re-election were held by Republicans. We won 18 of 18 seats, including a metropolitan Marion County, Indianapolis seat, in which the generic voter distribution started us off with a deficit of straight ticket voters of 65,000 votes, and we won it. And the question is, how did we do that? I mean, a lot of it has to do with taking risks. Leadership entails risk. Over the last eight years of Daniel's administration, we've invested in infrastructure, $3.8 billion in leasing our toll road. I can tell you it wasn't very popular in my district when I took it home, and I looked at the details. Mitch asked me to come into the office, and he said, Moran, I'd, I'd like you to support this. I said, Governor, you had me hello. And I signed on as the only Senate co-sponsor because it made sense. We've built 400 miles of new road. We have improved over 4,000 miles of road, 600 bridges, no cost to taxpayers. And yet it was unpopular. There was that cert out that said, you're leasing it to a consortium of Australians and Spanish. We're giving up our sovereignty. I said, I'll tell you what. If they try and steal our road, we'll see them and stop them. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how they reacted. Then they did. Well, well they maybe the it's not going anywhere. We balanced our budget. We've got a AAA credit rating, one of only nine states. And many of those other states have mineral resources that Indiana does not have. We've got $2 billion in the bank. And at a time where the per capita debt of states around the nation were going up by 35%, over the last decade, Indiana has cut its debt by 53% during the worst recession since the Great Depression. We spent less money. We didn't raise any taxes, we cut them. In fact, it was, let's go back to Illinois, I love talking about Illinois. I, uh, I introduced a bill to lower Indiana's corporate tax rate, it's too high. It was at 8.5%. Eight at the very same time, coincidentally, Illinois introduced a bill to raise theirs to 9.5%. We lowered ours to 6.5%. In the first 60 days, 16 companies moved from Illinois to Indiana. Leadership matters. We have the most aggressive education reform in the United States. 9,000 low-income Hoosier kids are now uh, availing themselves of vouchers. And that was not a pretty debate. In fact, it's a debate that's still ongoing. Tony Bennett, an outstanding superintendent of public instruction, was defeated. Now, he, he's now in Florida, he's head of education down there, making about four times as much money, so that's a pretty good defeat for him, but it was an ugly race. But it matters, Indiana has a graduation rate that is an all-time high, 86% and going up. We have the most attractive business climate in the Midwest, along with Wisconsin, now Michigan, led the way in taking the tough step of passing right to work. Since we've done that, over 80 companies have expressed interest in moving to Indiana, and specifically noted right to work is one of the reasons that they're taking a look at us. And yet not one of those decisions was easy. It was opposed aggressively by the traditional foes of conservative idealism. And 18 of 18 Republican senators won. How did they do it? Good candidates, a good message, and the money to move that message. I first got involved in politics uh, rather by surprise. I was a college newspaper reporter, reporter, and I had the opportunity to hear Ronald Reagan speak at Purdue. He had me at hello. Here was a guy working with a Democrat-controlled Congress, and yet he spoke a message that resonated with me and with my college age cohorts. Because it had humor, it had optimism, not only in the individual, but in our country. It's something we need to think long and hard about when we hear about the Republican Party being dead. 
It's not, it has a great story to tell. We just need to tell a little more. Indiana is very proud of what we've accomplished. And I'm very proud of all the, you know, tease the Lieutenant Governor, I'm very proud of the other folks who are here today as well. We are laboratories of innovation. We are proof positive that the way that Washington governs is not the way that the rest of the country wants to be governed and what we do can and will work. Uh, that's why I, I was willing to take a day off session and come out here and speak to you that in fact we got two billion dollars in the bank. I didn't figure they could do too much harm uh, in, in one day while I was gone. We're, uh, we're just about out of session. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here in the um, next week or so. And right now we have a budget that structurally balances. We will have two and a half billion dollars in surplus at the end of the biennium. We'll be putting 51% of our budget into education, which is the highest per capita in the nation. Not in terms of total dollars, but percentage of our total budget spend. And right now, we're arguing, it's a terrible argument to have, which tax to cut. <laughs> we've gotten rid of inheritance tax, we've lowered corporate tax, we've put property tax caps in our Constitution. And now we're discussing lowering the income tax. The only question we've got left is how much. It's a good place to be. But there was a lot of very difficult decisions, a lot of very tough leadership to get there. And groups like GOPAC are those that help allow us to make those tough decisions. So I thank you for having me and appreciate the opportunity to be here.